Good morning to everyone and thank you for joining us to this 13th in a series of free webinars hosted by the Chamber of Commerce under the theme supporting businesses in a time of crisis. I'm Will Pinot, I'm the CEO of the Chamber. Today we are partnering with Harneys to provide you with expert legal guidance on debt restructuring as a popular mechanism through which insolvent companies can continue to trade and return to profitability especially within the context of COVID-19 pandemic. The session will include information on various approaches to debt restructuring and different types of debt restructuring. You'll also benefit from working um, examples of debt restructuring for, for specific types of businesses or industries, as well as expert advice on protection for redeemed pensions that could otherwise become available to creditors. The members of the Harneys team who will guide us through today's webinar are Jason Wood, Jessica Williams, and Jaron Leslie, whom I will now formally introduce. Jason Wood is a partner in Harneys litigation, insolvency, and re restructuring practice, and is head of the Cayman Islands Restructuring Department. Jason has over 25 years experience in all aspects of corporate, insol and, corporate and insolvency litigation with expertise in cross-border debt restructurings of distressed companies. Prior to moving offshore in 2007, he was a partner in charge of the dispute resolution team of Mintner Ellison Lawyers Gold Coast in Australia. Jason is admitted to was admitted to practice in attorney in the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands and Bermuda. He has worked on many of the largest insolvent liquidations and restructurings of the Cayman Islands and Bermuda incorporated entities with a focus on US and Asia based companies and has appeared as lead counsel in multiple reported uh, decisions. His recent experience includes advising HKSE listed PRC property development firm Kaisa Group on the restructuring of a US $2.5 billion of offshore debts and the largest judicially approved multi-jurisdictional debt restructuring of a China-based group. Jessica Williams is a partner in Harney's litigation and insolvency practice group in the Cayman Islands office. She has experience in a broad range of commercial matters, including litigation and insolvency, probates and letters of administration, trusts and estates, trusts and private client litigation restructuring. Before joining Harneys in 2013, Jessica worked at A.L. Hall in Guernsey, advising on a range of commercial matters, many with a cross-border element. Before moving offshore, Jessica was a litigation lawyer at the Office of Fair Trading and was involved in a bank, in bank charges test case uh, prior to which she practiced as a commercial litigator at a New Zealand, New Zealand law firm. Sorry about that. Her current expertise includes insolvency and restructuring, trust litigation, financial services litigation, company disputes, and fraud and asset tracking. And Jaron Leslie, he's an associate and member of Harney's litigation, insolvency, and restructuring team in the Cayman Islands with a particular focus on shareholder appraisal litigation. His clientele includes insolvency practitioners. I'm sorry, I went off screen for a second there. Prior to joining Harney's, Jaron worked at the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority where he gained extensive experience and strong working knowledge of the Cayman Islands regulatory regime and techniques for auditing and inspection of financial services providers. He also has experience dealing with financial regulators in various jurisdictions. He's a member of the Cayman Islands Legal Practitioners Association and Insol International. So before I turn over to the Harneys team, let me remind you that you may submit questions during the presentation via the chat feature. We'll also be having our usual question and answer segment at the end of the presentation. We'll be taking your questions during the segment. There is a raised hand feature at the bottom of your screen, which allows you to indicate if you wish to ask a question. And at that which time I'll bring you up on the screen and unmute your microphone. So again, thank you for joining us. And right now I'm gonna 
turn it over to uh, Jaron, I believe. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Will, for the introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well in these weird and wonderful times that we're living through. Um, and I just want to say thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this presentation on debt restructuring in the Cayman Islands this morning. Um, I should also make mention that, of course, you will appreciate that in this forum, we're not able to give legal advice and we'll just be giving an overview of debt restructuring in the Cayman Islands. Um, with that said, let's move on. So we'll be touching base on economic climate, risk posed to a company or companies, debt restructuring, protective versus reactive measures, and a bit about pensions. And as Will said, we'll leave the Q&A uh, towards the back end of the presentation. Economic climate. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted us all greatly, and in the Cayman Islands, this impact has been acutely felt economically. With the necessary closure of businesses and reduced demand for products and services for those businesses that have remained fully or partially open. Of course, there are a few notable exceptions, such as essential services. While the government has approved a package which includes assistance to vulnerable Caymanians, no other major spending measures, including business support packages, have been announced. Local commercial banks have taken steps to alleviate certain debt obligations. But this is not, of course, mitigated non-bank debt or other financial obligations. At times of crisis, this is often an increase. There is often an increase in insolvency events. And looking at the press, you will make note of uh, in the UK and in the US a number of companies going into administration or a, a number of Chapter 11 filings. Of course, this is not not all attributed to the current crisis. And came in a similar pattern of relevant filing, filings have not happened, but you will of course note that there are a number of businesses that have closed recently. Therefore, in the context of the current climate, we thought it'd be useful to talk to you about the options for Cayman companies who are insolvent. And we'll get to the definition of an insolvent company shortly. Further, those companies that wish to turn around the situation and avoid the company being wound up and the relevant impact on creditors. Debt restructuring. Therefore, debt restructuring is a popular mechanism through which an insolvent company is able to continue to trade and hopefully return to profitability. Although to date in Cayman, this mechanism has been used more commonly by Cayman companies which operate overseas. This regime is designed to save viable businesses. And now we'll hand it over to Jason. Um, You're on mute, Jason. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, thanks very much, Sharon, and good morning, everyone. I mean, to, st to start off by stating the obvious, as we all appreciate, the longer the island's locked down or businesses are only able to trade on a limited basis, the harder it's going to become for those businesses to pay their creditors. You know, creditors who also have bills to pay and mouths to feed. But it's going to become more and more difficult to pay those creditors and there will be an increasing risk that those creditors are simply going to run out of patience and start taking legal action against the company uh, for either repayment of their debt or in extreme circumstances even to liquidate the company. So the primary question is, and the, I guess the theme for today, is that what steps can a company take to protect its business until such time as it, as it can get back on its feet? Well, the obvious first step to take is for a company to approach its creditors or for the directors to approach its creditors and try to agree upon a solution, try to do a deal. Um, and that's obviously the quickest and, and cheapest and easiest way, or not easiest, the quickest and cheapest way of doing it. But it's also the most difficult way to achieve a debt solution because in order to go down that track, you need to be able to reach agreement with each and every one of your creditors. And so all it would take is for one, one creditor to hold out on the deal and the whole plan is just not going to work. So um, that is the primary option that comes to people's minds uh, right from the get-go. I'll try to do a deal with all my creditors. But fortunately, um, under Cayman law, there is a way you can reach a deal with your creditors without having to get sign-off from each and every one of them. 
And that is there's a process under our company's law whereby if you can get most of your creditors who hold at least 75% of the value of the debt, if you can get those creditors at 75% to sign off on a deal, then that deal is going to be binding on all of your creditors, regardless of whether or not they agree. So, I mean, that's all well and good, but oftentimes reaching even a 75% agreement to a debt uh, restructuring uh, can be difficult and can take time. And obviously the longer things drag out, the more risk there is that uh, a creditor is going to come along and try to start suing or start liquidating the company. And so for that reason, in addition to having um, the 75% rule uh, under our laws, there's also a process by which um, the company can be protected um, for so long as it's trying to negotiate a deal with its creditors. And I'll pass over to Jessica to explain some of those protective measures. Thanks, Jason. Um, so in recent years, there's been a focus in Cayman on rescuing companies in financial distress, rather than letting them fall into liquidation. And a key aspect of that is, is just what Jason mentioned, um, the ability of the court to prevent um, anyone from suing um, or liquidating a company. Um, and that's called the moratorium on claims. Now in Cayman, this can be achieved through the appointment of restructuring provisional liquidators. And this along um, with schemes of arrangement, which Jason um, just mentioned, are the principal tools um, for restructuring um, in Cayman. So the, the Cayman Islands doesn't have an equivalent of administration, um, an exact equivalent of administration in the UK or a Chapter 11 filing in the US. Instead, um, we have um, the mechanism um, by which um, a company applies to appoint restructuring provisional liquidators um, to, achieve, to achieve essentially the same aims. Um, now, if a company is unable to pay its debts um, and it intends to present a compromise to its creditors, um, then the court can appoint um, a local um, insolvency practitioner um, who is the restructuring provisional liquidator to the company. And once that's done, no one can commence or continue um, with any court action um, against the company um, without the permission of the court. So that's the moratorium on claims and it gives um, a company breathing room um, to hopefully um, work out a deal um, with its creditors and, and, and come out of a, a difficult situation. Um, I'll just note um, two more points. Um, the moratorium doesn't have um, extraterritorial effect. Um, so if the company has foreign law governed debt or um, it's it, there's claims against it um, in, in other uh, countries, it may need to take steps um, to have the appointment of the restructuring provisional liquidators recognised elsewhere. Um, the other point is, is that the moratorium doesn't affect secured creditors. So we're going to work through an example just, just to show how the process works. But before we do that, um, Jason will just talk us briefly through um, the main types of of debt restructuring um, that, that we see. Good, thanks very much, Jess. So I'm not sure if I'm, am I on? Sorry. Yes, you are. Oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> sorry I, I can, I'm, I'm looking at your, your, your lovely video. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, now, in our experience, um, when it comes to debt restructuring, debt restructuring is really just, a, I guess, a fancy term for, you know, reaching a deal with your creditors. Um, but basically, uh, what we see in the market, there's principally three types of debt restructuring. Um, the first type is uh, creditors agreeing to defer the time for, payment, the time for payment of their debt to some future date. So instead of the debt being due right now, um, and in that case, being able to be sued upon, uh, the time for payment of the debt gets put off into the future. And so that, that releases uh, you know, the, uh, the, the creditor's entitlement to do. Now, getting creditors to agree to a deferral uh, for payment of their debt to a future date, I mean, that, that's a good option if the company is one which is going through a tough patch at the moment but which will return to profitability at some point down the track. 
And it's a good option for the company because, it, as I say, it releases that debt pressure that's on the company. But it's also good for creditors because it means that once a company does return to profitability, they'll be paid out 100 cents in the dollar, most likely. Mm -hmm. But they'll just have to wait a bit longer for their money. So I can't, this is you know, very much in the sort of win-win type, uh, type of debt restructuring. Uh, the second type of debt restructuring we see often, um, and again, this is in relation to a company that has good prospects, you know, for returning to profitability down the track. Um, the second option is to offer creditors a debt for equity swap. That is to offer creditors a certain number of shares in the company in exchange for discharging their debt. So the result of that, um, if it's successful, means that the company is completely debt free coming out of the restructuring, but the owners have had to give up some of their equity in the company. And the third uh, type of restructuring we often come across um, is, I guess, the obvious one. Um, and that's where a company offers creditors X number of cents on the dollar uh, in return for uh, those debts being released. Now, this is a good option. If, if a company is not looking at a natural return to profitability, um, or even if it is, but it's currently suffering under a very heavy debt burden and that's causing it to, to not be able to trade properly. That's where this sort of option is a good one. Um, because um, if the company has such a debt burden, what the directors can do is go to creditors and say, well, look, no, we're not trading properly at the moment. We're not going to trade properly unless we get rid of this debt burden. And if we don't get rid of the debt burden, we're going to go into liquidation. And if we go into liquidation, you're going to get, you as a creditor are going to get, say, 10 cents on the dollar return. So what I'm going to do is offer you now, say, 15 cents on the dollar in return for you uh, releasing your debt. So you can either wait for the company to go into liquidation and get your 10 cents, or you can take more than that now and let the company trade on. Um, so that's the third option. So, so in summary, you've got the... Um, you've got the debt, debt deferral option, which is commonly used, you have the debt for equity swap option, which is commonly used, and also um, offering cents on the dollar, which are higher than, which would be higher than a liquidation amount. So they're the three main options. And of course, you can do any combination of those three options. Uh, but you have to do the same combination uh, with each, each of the creditors. You can't pick and choose different deals for different creditors. Now, to state the obvious, um, I mean, some directors won't want to approach creditors directly to do these negotiations, but there's no rule that says you have to. Um, you, can, you can do the negotiating with the creditors yourself. You can appoint someone else to do that for you. Or if, as Jess touched on, if restructuring provisional liquidators have been appointed, then they can, t they can do it for you. Um, so there are you know, quite a number of options. It's a very flexible remedy when it comes to the deal you do with creditors and who can sort of you know, do the negotiations and cement that deal for you. Um, and I think probably a good way to, to demonstrate how it all works is to, to go to an example, uh, a, a practical example, which I'll uh, turn over to Jaron for. Uh, thank you, Jason. So as Jason and Jess said, we've uh, wanted to give you guys a few examples of these measures uh, and reactive measures. The first example we're going to use is HATS Limited, and apologies if there is a HATS Limited on the island, certainly it wasn't our intention to use that as an example. So HATS Limited is a Cayman Islands company which carries on business of manufacturing and selling hats and has a number of successful retail stores in Cayman. Because of the shelter-in-place regulations, it has been closed for over two months. It has ongoings including rent and a number of creditors, which includes bank credit debt. It has creditors in and outside of the Cayman Islands, but all of the relevant agreements are governed by Cayman law. It has a number of accounts receivables, but its customers are also struggling. Therefore, it is balance sheet solvent, but cash flow insolvent. The shareholders have injected additional cash into the business, which has bought the business some time, and is expected that receivables will be paid within the next six months. The company has also offered its creditors a deal, essentially deferring in the time of payment, and has, and has reduced the rate to avoid liquidation. 
but a major creditor is starting to threaten proceedings and will not agree to hold fast. Due to this, the, the directors therefore have decided to apply to the court for the appointment of restructuring provisional liquidators. Thanks, Jaron. Um, now, we should just say at this stage that the term um, provisional liquidators can be confusing um, and can conjure up um, negative connotations, um, such as that the company is being liquidated, um, but that's not the case. Um, fortunately, um, in, and some of you may be aware of this, that there is currently um, a draft bill which is being consulted on um, which will um, change the company's law to rebadge uh, these appointees as, as restructuring officers. Um, and you may be able to read more about that in the coming months. Um, so turning back to the example, the gateway for the appointment of restructuring provisional liquidators is that you need to demonstrate um, two things. First, um, that the company is unable to pay its debts within the meaning of the company's law, uh, which is a cash flow test. Um, and Secondly, uh, that it intends to present a compromise or arrangement to its creditors. Now here we know that the company meets the first part of the test. Um, as to the second part, um, it is in a high hurdle and the company doesn't need to show that um, there's a proposed deal already in existence or that there are a good number of creditors um, already on board. It's sufficient to show um, that the company generally intends to present a compromise to its creditors um, and, and that's the case here. Uh, so we thought um, we would just give you some um, practical tips um, about the actual process of the application. Um, now, the first one um, on, our, on our list on the slide may seem counterintuitive um, to apply for the um, appointment of restructuring provisional liquidators. Um, the application must be um, accompanied or on, on the back of a winding up petition. Now, obviously, this seems counterintuitive, but at the moment, it's simply the mechanism by which the application um, can be made under the law um, and is, in, is necessary in the absence of a, a freestanding administration regime. Um, and that's one of the reasons why um, there will likely be a change of law soon. Um, another point to note is you want to check um, the articles of association of the company if this is something um, that the company is intending to do um, because there may be a roadblock there. The articles need to provide um, for the directors having the authority to present a winding up petition without a shareholder's resolution. Um, now, if a shareholder's resolution is needed um, and it can't be obtained or it can't be obtained in time, um, there is a workaround which is developed from um, case law, um, which we'll talk about a, a bit later on. Um, there, there is a filing fee um, and, and that's in relation to the winding up petition. Uh, which is 5,000 um, CI. Um, and that's because it's a filing within the financial services division. Now that fee covers the filing fee and it covers three hearing fees. Um, so the only additional fees for the court uh, will be if you um, have a go over and above the three allocated hearing fees. Um, and those fees are $750 uh, per hearing um, per day. Um, now the application is, is accompanied by certain documents. Uh, the winding up proceeding needs to be accompanied by an affidavit which verifies uh, the facts that are set out in the petition. And um, that's usually um, uh, sworn by a director. Uh, there also be um, one or more, if there's going to be more than one restructuring provisional liquidator appointed an, an affidavit from them um, setting out certain requirements to show that they, are, that they have the qualification to act. And there will also be an affidavit in support of um, the application itself um, to demonstrate that the company has, has met the gateway um, test for the relief. Um, now, an application like this will usually come on before a judge quickly because by its nature, it, it's an urgent application. The application can be made ex parte, so not on notice to creditors, but it's more common for creditors to at least um, have some notice um, and oftentimes, um, the application will be made with um, creditors' knowledge um, and support. Um, so we're just going to turn back to the example again, and, and Jason's going to run us through a few points. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Well, off the back of what you've just said, Jess, if assuming the application for the appointment of restructuring provisional liquidators is successful, obviously the question is what happens next? And as you touched on earlier, Jess, uh, the, the most critical 
point about getting restructuring provisional liquidators appointed is that it puts in place the moratorium. That is, it automatically freezes creditors so that uh, those creditors can't commence proceedings against the company and um, can't commence liquidation proceedings, um, thereby you know, creating breathing space for the directors uh, or the restructuring provisional liquidators to try to do a deal with creditors. I mean, you can't, you can't go down that negotiation path with some creditors you know, if you've got other creditors that are you know, trying to sue you uphill and down Dale, it just doesn't work. You need that breathing space and that's the critical um, result of having restructuring uh, provisional liquidators put in. Now, restructuring provisional liquidators, they're not kind of scary things. I mean, their role uh, is defined by the court and uh, it's very, very flexible. And the powers they'll be given, given will depend very much on what that role is going to be. But in a typical case, uh, the restructuring provisional liquidators will only have very light touch powers, that is powers of oversight. So usually uh, the restructuring provisional liquidators are appointed. Um, the directors uh, keep running the business in the usual way, but without creditor pressure. So they still maintain the day-to-day -day running of the business um, and the restructuring provisional liquidators uh, maintain an oversight role. Um, but the whole thing, as I say, is quite flexible. It might be that um, the directors might want the restructuring provisional liquidators to have greater powers. Like for example, they may want uh, the restructuring provisional liquidators to do the negotiating with creditors so they can be given that power. Um, but it's really, as I say, it's very flexible. It just depends on the particular case um, at the time. And also depends a lot on the way that the directors want to run this thing. So at the end of the day, um, in a large sense, um, the, role of the, uh, the, uh, the role of the restructuring provisional liquidators will depend very much on what the directors want them for. Um, now, in, in addition to the restructuring provisional liquidators supervising uh, the restructuring negotiations or undertaking them, uh, the court also has a, a supervisory role. But once again, that's, that's also very light touch. Um, it's not a situation where you're going to be having to go back to court every every second week, as you might do in, a, say, a proper liquidation. It's not like that at all. The court has a very sort of light touch approach, and uh, the restructuring provisional liquidators will probably every couple of months or so prepare a report for the judge to read, and that report will be given to the judge as well as to creditors and to the directors just to update them about how how the restructuring is coming along. Um, and so that's the way sort of things start off with the role of the provisional liquidator and its reporting, reporting requirements. Now, what the restructuring provisional liquidators do is they'll stay in office, they'll stay appointed until a deal's worked out with the creditors. And for this purpose, I mean, the court won't let everything run on forever. The court won't put the creditors on hold forever uh, while negotiations go on for you know, year after year. But the courts are pretty generous with their time and they'll usually put the, the creditor freeze in place uh, for at least a couple of months just to see how things go. And if there are promising signs at the end of that, that couple of months, then they'll grant further uh, time for negotiation. Now, if everything's successful and a deal's done, it, uh, it gets approved by the court, which is usually a fairly straightforward process. I mean, if the deal um, if everyone's acted in good faith and you know, the deal's basically a fair one, um, then the court uh, will, generally speaking, will approve it. So that's, that's normally fairly straightforward. And once that deal is approved, it's then crammed down onto all the creditors. So you've got your 75% that approve it. Um, that deal goes to court. It's then crammed down on all your creditors. So then they're all bound by it. And at that point in time, the restructuring provisional liquidators are removed. They leave office. However, if a deal's not made, um, if every, everyone pulls out all stops to try to do a deal, creditors can't agree, uh, then the company will be put into liquidation. So with all this talk about court and restructuring provisional liquidators, obviously you know, cost is gonna be top of mind for everyone. Um, and not only the cost, but also, I guess, who pays for the process. Now, there will be upfront costs for the preparation of the court documents, the lawyer fees. Uh, there will be upfront for costs uh, for the document preparation for the lawyer turning up to court to, uh, to get the restructuring provisional liquidators appointed. 
but the level of cost will depend very much on the complexity of the restructuring. And so um, obviously if it's a fairly straightforward restructuring, you have a company that's got, I don't know, 10, 15 creditors, that's gonna involve a whole lot less work than if you've got a, a company that's got hundreds of creditors. Um, and so the lawyer's fees you know, very much come down to the complex complexity of the case. But as a rule, I mean, they're not huge, if I can put it that way. Um, and uh, they are, generally speaking, much less than what would be incurred in a liquidation. So you've got the lawyer's fees, and lawyers can give a pretty accurate quote. If you go to see a lawyer, talk to your lawyer, um, explain to him um, the situation, that you want to go down the restructuring path, he can usually give you a, a pretty good feel for how much it's going to cost. And likewise, with the restructuring provisional liquidators, there's, there's going to be a cost incurred there because um, they're going to be insolvency practitioners, and which, which are essentially accountants that specialise in, in insolvency. So they're going to have their usual accounting fees. Once again, the level of their fees will depend upon their role, whether it's merely an oversight role or whether they're going to actually get roll their sleeves up and run the business. Um, so their fees will, will depend on that. But once again, have a chat to your accountant. Um, they, they can very often you know, give you know, quite an accurate fee or an accurate cost estimate as what, you know, what it's going to take to get down this restructuring route. Um, just as a, as a, a, a tip, I guess, um, restructuring, getting uh, restructuring provisional liquidators appointed, getting schemes in place and approved by the court. I mean, to be honest, from a legal perspective, it's not rocket science, but you do need to know what you're doing. Um, it's one of those areas of, of it's, it's really quite specialized and you either know how to do it or you don't. And so, if you're talking to your lawyer or talking to your accountant, do ask whether or not they've got experience in restructurings. Um, and if they don't, you may end up sort of paying for them to learn on the job. So maybe, yeah, as I say, just as a tip, um, probably go to people or use people who know what they're, what they're doing and who have done this before. Now, in relation to liability for payment of the costs of the restructuring, um, that falls upon the company. Um, which is probably you know, quite obvious. But in our experience, that's, that's not always the case. And by that, what I mean is that not infrequently, uh, creditors will also contribute to the cost of the restructuring um, or pay all of the restructuring. And that usually happens in a scenario where you have a company with a viable business, but it just doesn't have the cash to go down the restructuring route. And in those cases, creditors may take the view of, well, look, if we do nothing in sit back, this company is going to go to the wall, it's going to be liquidated, and we're going to get a couple of cents on the dollar. It's in our interests to actually have this company restructured so that we can get a greater return down the track. And to do that, we're happy to, to throw some money at it. So, so that, that, that can and does happen where creditors will sort of hit the tin for the cost of the restructuring, whether if the company uh, doesn't have the money to do it itself. So uh, I guess uh, in summary, if you have a company uh, which has been hit by the lockdown and you want and being pressured by creditors and you wanted to want to look at this restructuring route, talk to your lawyer, talk to your accountant. Uh, I mean, this won't be a viable option for every business um, because there is a cost involved and sometimes that cost you know just just doesn't justify uh, going down this track. Uh, but if you get the, at least get that information up front on the cost side of things, um, at least you'll have the information that you, you need to, to make an informed decision. Now, we're going to briefly work through a different example, and, I, and I'll uh, throw back to Jaron to talk to you about that. Thank you, Jason. So this other example, we're going to be looking at a reactive approach. So this is a wait and see approach. The example we're going to use is Raise Limited. So Raise Limited is a Cayman company which carries on the business of providing speed boats to tourists and has a large fleet of boats. Because of the shelter in place regulations, it's been closed for over two months. It has a number of creditors, which mainly includes private debt, it has creditors in both the Cayman Islands, in the Cayman Islands, and outside of the Cayman Islands, and some of their agreements are governed by foreign law. The company is balance sheet solvent owning its own fleets, 
fleet of boats, but is cash flow insolvent. Most of its creditors have agreed to the further payment for at least six months, but for one creditor, <laughs> ABC Limited, has not agreed, but also has not specifically said it would take court action. The company decides to wait and see, decides to use the wait to approach rather than raising its court. Two months later, ABC files a winding up, seeking a winding up of the company on the basis that it cannot pay its debts. So, what can the company do? It's not in a position to dispute the debt, a debt is due and owing. However, the company can't apply for provisional liquidators on the back of credit decision as a back and um, Thanks, Sharon. Um, you, were, you were just breaking up slightly, so I'll just repeat the, the last point you said, um, but which we, we, might, we might have understood. Um, so the company can apply for um, provisional liquidators off the back of um, ABC's um, creditors petition as a defensive mechanism. Um, now Jason will talk a, a bit more about um, the risk of doing that in a moment, but um, first it's just worth noting um, as an aside, like if in the first scenario um, that we talked about, if the directors of HATS Limited were not able to issue a petition to wind up um, without shareholders' approval because of um, the um, Articles of Association, um, there is a workaround which is recognised by the court. Um, so HATS Limited um, could apply um, for the appointment of a restructuring provisional liquidator off the back of a friendly um, creditors' <coughs> petition. Um, what we mean by that is that a petition is pre presented by a creditor um, for the specific purpose of providing a mechanism by which the company can seek um, the appointment of provisional liquidators. So it's a workaround um, that the court has recognised um, in a number of recent cases. Um, now I'll pass on um, to Jason to just to wrap up um, this example. Yeah, thanks very much, Jess. And so um, I guess, guess to recap, when it comes to appointing restructuring provisional liquidators, you can either make, um, you know, be proactive, make the application up front, uh, get the moratorium, get the credit of freeze in place up front, and then go down the negotiation path to see if you can get a deal done. Or you can be reactive. Um, you can sit back and take the view, well, look, maybe no credit is going to come, come after me. Why, why do I need to go to this exp expense up front? Um, what I can do is wait and see what the creditors do, see if someone, one of them does uh, file for liquidation of the company and then tackle that as and when it does come up. Um, and that's obviously, you know, being, being reactive to the situation. Now, being proactive, everything's fine. The, the, the creditor freeze is put in place, restructuring provisional liquidators are appointed and you know, the negotiations begin uh, within the background, the directors running the company as normal. Now, in relation to Raise Limited, it's, it's looking at uh, taking a reactive approach. And there is some risk in taking that wait and see approach because um, what you don't want is to have a creditor issue a liquidation uh, application. A liquidation application which um, judges have said time and time again, look, if you have an insolvent company that a creditor wants to wind up, then that creditor is entitled to a winding up order almost as of right. So that's the legal position. And so what you don't want is uh, for a creditor to file for liquidation of the company, you turn up to court to say you want to get restructuring provisional liquidators appointed. And when you, you, know, when you arrive at the court, um, there's not only the, the original creditor, but a whole bunch of other creditors all saying, look, you know, we don't want to do a deal. We're never going to do a deal. We want this company wound up. Um, because if that happens, there's a risk that the, that the judge will say, yeah, well, that's what I'll do. There doesn't seem much point in going down the negotiation path with the creditors. Now, in a practical sense, that risk is pretty low. Um, I've come across that problem as is Jess on a number of occasions where you have you turn up to court and creditors are, um, are virtually yelling from the rooftops, "We want this company liquidated." You have the company saying, "No, there's a there's a pathway through here. We think, and we think that we can sort of." Uh, do a deal with these creditors and get things sorted out. Um, I mean, the judges ordinarily will give the directors at least a shot at doing a deal with the creditors. Um, if, um, that, that, if the deal doesn't seem to be, isn't an obvious one, 
to the judge that he may just give, you know, he may say, look, go and try your do, do your deal, come back in a, in a month or two and let me know how it's going. Um, so generally speaking, the, the, the judge will um, appoint the restructuring provisional liquidators, even if you have creditors jumping up and down and saying they want a liquidation. But you can't rule out completely the risk that um, by adopting the wait and see approach, by the time you get to the court, uh, you may not get your restructuring provisional liquidators appointed and the judge uh, may proceed to wind up the company. As I say, though, the risk of that happening is uh, pretty low, but it's still there. Um, I think the final topic we wanted to have a chat about was um, pensions. And if I can pass you over to Jaren to start off with that. Thank you, James. As you all know, recently, the Kim Nolan's government has passed amendments to the pension law, but not pensions amendment law 2020. Under the amended, amended legislation, individuals will be able to withdraw up to 100% of the pension funds not exceeding 10,000, and 25% of funds in excess of 10,000. These changes will be in effect for six months and will apply only to the private sector individuals. Thanks, Jaron. So, so that's the legal framework uh, within which we're operating. We, we all know the Premier is allowing us to withdraw our pension funds up to a certain limit. Um, but what must be uh, borne in mind at all times, and, and one of the points I really wanted to emphasise today, is that for company directors who withdraw their pension funds, the money's paid to them. It's paid to them as individuals. It's their money. It's not money... Uh, belong, that belongs to the company and it's not money that's available for creditors to claim against. So that gives rise to a couple of considerations. Um, first and, and probably foremost is that uh, the directors own the money and they want to be able to keep it that way. Um, and by that, what I mean is that under the, under the rules of law, um, assets of the, that are owned by the directors um, are not available to company creditors because having the company in between the creditor uh, and the director, that company, that corporate entity creates in effect a firewall that creditors can't get through to get to the director's uh, assets. Um, I mean, everyone probably knows that's the way companies, companies operate. You have a corporate veil, you have a firewall that, that separates the, um, the director's assets or the shareholder's assets from the company's assets. Now, if directors are acting honestly and in the best interest of the company, acting in good faith, so on and so forth, that's not a problem. But there are ways that creditors uh, can penetrate that corporate firewall to get to the director's assets. Now, generally speaking, that, that can happen when directors misbehave, breach their duties, engage in fraudulent activities, that sort of obvious type stuff. But there are quite a lot of rules in place, a lot of management rules for directors to follow. And it is possible that directors can inadvertently, accidentally, um, do something wrong, which will put their assets and put their pension monies that they've drawn, can put those assets at risk. So um, directors do need to be pretty careful about the way they conduct themselves. They can't simply sit back and say, well, you know, I've got a company in place, you can't touch me, you have to go after the company doesn't always work like that because there are ways, as I say, even accidentally, that directors can do something wrong um, without even knowing it. And all of a sudden, their assets are at risk, uh, at risk of claims uh, by company creditors. Now, if you've got any concerns about that, about the best way to conduct um, your role as a director so as not to leave your personal assets at risk, um, please have a chat to your lawyer, have a chat to your accountant. Um, there are ways and means, there are processes you can put in place to drastically minimise the risk um, to your own personal assets, you know, through doing something that you just didn't mean to. There are ways and means um, that you can stop that from happening. Um, so if you want to sort of you know, take advantage of those ways and means, definitely talk to your lawyer or talk to your accountant. And the second consideration and this is really a practical one. And um, Jess, Jaron and I see it sort of time and time again, is that directors shouldn't be too tempted to put too much of their pension drawings into the company. Now, that might sound like a pretty obvious point. You know, why tip your personal assets into the company to pay creditors? 
You know, you've got to be careful about it. It may sound like an obvious point, but time and time again, what we see is directors pouring their own money into a company in the misplaced faith or belief that that business is going to turn around down the track. And then when it doesn't turn around, not only does the business go under, but the directors and their families have no money either because if they've poured it all into the company. So I'm, I'm just, all I'm saying is just be a bit careful. Don't um, you know, just draw on your entire pension fund and pay it across. Um, definitely have a chat to, to someone, financial advisor, accountant, probably not a lawyer, uh, but a financial advisor or an accountant um, about the, the, the merits of putting, you know, putting your pension fund into, into company debt. Now, I think that just about covers off all the topics we wanted to, uh, to address you on today. I, I guess probably the main takeaways from today are, um, if you want to do a debt restructuring, if, you, if you're feeling credit or pressure, you don't need to get a uh, complete um, a creditor sign off to a deal. Um, it is sufficient if most of your creditors who hold more than 75% of the debt agree to a deal. That deal then applies across all the company's creditors. Um, so I think that's sort of point number one. Point number two, um, if you're wanting to do a deal, there are um, processes you can put in place in the form of restructuring provisional liquidators that can freeze creditor claims and give you breathing space to negotiate a deal. Um, and I guess the third takeaway from today, uh, well, the third main takeaway, I think, is in relation to um, any pension funds you draw down on. Just be really careful not to do anything which uh, might cause creditors to be able to penetrate that company firewall to get to that money. Um, I think that just about uh, that's about it for us, and I'll pass back to uh, to Will and Sharon. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, and uh, again, I invite everyone to um, post your questions to the chat or raise your hand if you do have a question. I'll unmute your mic. I, I guess the, the main question that I, I would uh, start off is, have you seen um, in your practice or among your colleagues uh, a kind of a big demand for this service at this time? I mean, are we beginning to see the fallout from COVID-19 in the economic um, that, that's a, that's a, a, a great question. And a question that uh, we in the restructuring team talk about, I won't say daily, but certainly weekly. Um, at this point in time, no. Um, we're getting lots and lots of inquiries from companies, not, not so much Cayman-based companies, but more sort of companies out of the US and out of Asia, uh, inquiries about restructurings, but people aren't sort of pushing, you know, pulling the trigger at the moment as far as we can see. The, the, the flood hasn't come in. The flood that I, I guess people are expecting hasn't come in yet. And we, and we kind of think the reason for that might be um, you know, the economic crash back in 2008, 2009, where at that point in time, um, you know, with the credit crunch, everyone, businesses, companies, all kind of went into a bit of a panic and started you know, trying to liquidate companies and doing all this sort of stuff, which in hindsight was all a bit crazy. So it's almost like, so here we are 10 years later, we've been through one economic crisis um, and companies and creditors have learned from that. And so this time around, they're being a, a lot more patient and a lot more sort of reasoned in the steps they're going to take. So at this point, um, everyone seems to be sort of hunkered down, not really doing anything, um, just waiting to see what happens. Unlike, as I say, last time, it was just a mad panic. Right. Now, um, I have a question here. How do you apply the same structure to all creditors you have bank lenders, private uh, lenders, bondholders, accounts payable. Yeah, well, well, in relation to restructuring, um, they are, they, what the court looks at or what the law looks at is different classes of creditors. And they look at creditor rights. So let's say, for example, you're running a company um, and you know, you're able to kind of pay your debts on the run through, but you're really sort of, really sort of feeling the pinch. Um, then uh, the, the offer you make to your creditors has to be made um, to creditors who, who have the same or similar rights. And so you may have, say, employee claims, which are, uh, are on a different legal basis to, say, the claim from you know, the, uh, the, the company, you know, the, claims, the claims your office. 
And so you need to look at these different classes of claims. As I say, you know, there might be creditor claims, uh, sorry, there might be employee claims, there might be sort of general creditor claims, uh, there may be note holder claims, um, and, and look to see whether there's that they're sort of similar enough to keep putting the same group. And if they are similar enough to, to group together, then the same offer has to be made to that entire group. You can't cherry pick and say, well, you know, I'll offer this deal to this creditor and then another, or, or this deal to this employee and this other employee I'll offer a different deal to. You can't do that. That's not going to be fair. Um, and so you do have to offer the same deal across all the creditors, but you do separate them into classes. Um, and different classes can have different deals. You may do a different deal with note holders than what you do with employees, for example. And uh, I hope that, that makes sense. And and again, um, it's I think uh, the economic fallout from COVID. You know, we we may very well have some companies that will will require this type of service. Um, you know, what's what's your what basic advice to these companies that? Uh, you know, trying to, to trying to keep things together. I mean, you know, no one wants to admit that they had they need help. Um, what do you think the first step is for these companies that really don't know where anywhere anywhere to turn? Yeah, well, I mean, the first step is, and I know it's it's probably the most difficult step, but the first step is communication, communication with creditors, and creditors communication with communicating with with companies as well. It's when those lines of communication break down that terrible things happen, you end up getting hit with a winding up petition or you end up, you know, a writ out of the, out of the, the grand court. Um, and I say that's difficult because, you know, a, a company director, for example, he really doesn't want to jump on the phone and talk to a, a creditor and he knows he's going to get told off. I mean, that's, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, but if you can't do it, if or you don't feel comfortable doing that, um, as I mentioned before, sort of have a chat to someone, have a chat to your accountant, your financial advisor, even a mate, have a talk, talk to you know friends who may be able to sort of um, do those, you know, have that, make those credit calls for you. And, and at least we're, we're we're hearing. I mean, we're hearing governments and everybody, you know, borrowing and massive amounts of money, and you know, the the amount of debt in the world is probably at a historic high. I mean. You're, you're probably going to be in business for a very long time. <laughs> um, the, real, the reality is, yes, debt's part, part of any business's strategy, I guess. But at the end of the day, when is it too much? I mean, you know, we've got, um, you know, we've, we've, we're hearing some things. Government hopefully will be announcing some, some um, actions that they're going to be taking. But, you know, what do you say, you know, when a company is just has just basically too much debt? It's, 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 a, it's a massive problem that's going to get worse. And especially um, debt at the moment. I mean, the, the, the cost of debt, the price of debt, interest rates, they're, they're, they're rock bottom. Um, so it's easy to get your hands on that money and it's obviously equally as easy to overcommit. And that maybe gets back to, a, to an extent to the point I made before about um, you know, pouring, your own, pouring your pension money, your personal pension money into a business to keep it afloat. Uh, the same goes for debt. Um, just be, you know, really careful because with debt, I mean, if you go to Butterfield and you want to borrow money for your company, they're going to want a personal guarantee from you. So your personal neck's going to be on the line anyway. But just be careful and not have that misplaced faith or confidence that your business, you know, it, it's going to kill it once all of this is over. Um, you know, get some independent advice. Um, you know, that, that love you have for your business might unfortunately be sort of may, may not reflect reality. So you just got to be got to be very careful. And as I say, especially given that the cost of debt at the moment is really low. Right. All right. Well, it doesn't look like we have too many more questions. Um, I'm just going to give a last chance. Anybody have a question for the chat? Or if you want to put your hand up or raise your hand, if you have a question, I'll unmute your mic. But if not, I'm just simply going to say thank you all for thank thank your harneys and your representatives here for delivering a really excellent presentation. Um, as I've said at the earlier part of this, we recorded this, so it'll be posted to the Cayman Chambers 
uh, website, uh, chamberofcovidupdates.ky, so anybody can refer to it um, if they may have missed something. And certainly encourage you, um, anybody on this call and listening in the future, please call any one of these uh, experts. As, as um, Jason and Jared has actually clearly said, you'll want to really consult with an expert if you're going to be doing debt restructuring. It may sound, may, like you said, maybe some people say they know how to do it, but you just really want to um, interact with expert attorneys that can get this done the right way for you. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's um, Chamber webinar. We have another webinar coming up on Friday. So check out the website and register if you're interested in that topic. So thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jared, for, um, Jaren, for your um, excellent advice and participating with us today. Right. Thanks for having us. Thanks thank very you. much, Will. Thank you, Will. Thank you.